Welcome, everybody, to the Three Gun Show. I'm Dave Hartman, your host, and with me is Heather Miller. Heather, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm really pumped to have you. So it's been a, a couple of years since you've been on the show here, and you've been up to a lot. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about it all here. Yeah, I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Well, Heather, we uh, I want to get to the uh, the world shoot. You just got back from France, and you're uh, reacclimating and getting back in the swing of things here. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to I want to talk about your journey as a shooter. And we uh, we missed that last time you were on the show, um, but uh, but now's our chance. So Heather, let's uh, let's do a little brief introduction of yourself for the audience. Who are you off the range? What do you do when you're not shooting? Work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so. Um... You know, I work full time. Uh, I work, I am director of marketing for a company called Quantico Tactical. Uh, we also actually just rebranded our retail side, which is now called Proven Arms and Outfitters. Uh, but yeah, so I work full time. Uh, I've recently, for about the past year, uh, about a year ago, I started working full time again, uh, mm -hmm. not just shooting. So, um, I've been in the past year really trying to balance a career and shooting at the same time, which, you know, definitely creates its own challenges. And sometimes I question my own sanity, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and the reality of it, that is most shooters, mm -hmm. you know, 90, probably, probably 98% of shooters have a full-time job that they have to balance on top of shooting. And it's something that um, I really, I enjoy uh, being able to do both. Um, but, you know, my my journey with shooting uh, really started out uh, about 20, 2010. I mean, no, well, at least I should say my journey with competitive <laughs> shooting started in about right. 2010. Well, did, you, um, did you grow up shooting, first of all? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I am my dad's daughter and, uh, you know, I love my mother, but you know, my, my dad was the one that was always going to the range. My dad's always been, my dad's a phenomenal shooter. Like he's, he's always been, you know, a good long range shooter, good close range. My dad went from military, military into law enforcement. And the first time I went to the range, I was four years old and we, I remember he was shooting a 30 off six. Um, cause I remember it was really, really, really loud and he was worried about the ear pro. And so I remember he would say, okay, we're going to shoot the big gun. Now run and jump in the truck. And I would jump in the truck and cover my ears and later <laughs> and half the time <laughs> I would wake up pissed off, <laughs> a pissed off four year old because I would wake up cause I would, I would generally lay there with my ears covered and my brother, my dad would have shot so long, but, uh, I would generally fall asleep like most four year olds do. Yeah. And then I wake up and all the fun was done. I was like, I was super pissed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was like, this is not fair. But, uh, eventually, you know, I got fair and got better ear pro. And I mean, that was what I did with my dad was we would go on the range and we would shoot and we shoot pistol, rifle, shotgun, you name it. Um, my parents bought a large uh, portion of property there in South Texas, and we moved there when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's funny because I look back and that, you know, when I hit my teenage years, I turned into a a, a, a typical teenage girl. <laughs> <laughs> really, really easy to get along with. Yeah, super easy to get along with. Really, <laughs> even tempered, hormones totally in balance. Uh, and I remember like hating living in the country and just being like, Bleh! like I hated it, which was like for like about three years of my life. I was like, ah, no, I want to be a city girl and don't, I don't want this anymore. And then I think about a year, maybe about a year of living in the city. It was like, I wish I could have gone back to the country because you could literally walk out the back door and we had a berm that we had built out of dirt and wood and you're like you could shoot anything. You could literally do anything. You could shoot anything. You could walk out. You could hunt. You could just like be like, I'm gonna go hunt rabbits today. And just like roll out the back, you know. And it was it was a great uh, upbringing. And I thank God that I had parents that introduced me to the shooting sports and 
and uh, well, not so not so much the shooting sports, but introduced me to firearms, right, to like back. recreational shooting. Yeah, like I loved it. You know, when I was eight years old, I have a picture somewhere. I asked my parents for two things for Christmas, and it was a Red Ryder BB gun and a old timer uh, skinning knife. And oh, really? yeah, and I got both of them because I was ready to hunt because I knew when I was nine I could go hunting with my dad. So I was like. I got you for Christmas. I'm going to get the Red Rider, which couldn't kill maybe a bird. I don't know. But I was right. like, gun. it's still a gun to me. <laughs> so I got that at my old timer skinny knife. And then when I was nine, I got to go hunting with my dad. And so I grew up hunting and I had that solid foundation, a very solid, positive foundation in firearms. Mm -hmm. And I, gosh, I wish the shooting sports were then what they are now because like my parents had no idea what it was you know they didn't know that us psa or any of that stuff existed so yeah it well, was you look at like the uh, the juniors that we shoot with you know that they've got yeah. such a, a leg up being 17 18 years old and and being able to play in this sport oh i know it's like you look at um I'm always impressed by the juniors you know we have uh garrett dietrich and dakota overland and I look at them like, oh my gosh, you were like just two years ago, you were like this big and you know, <laughs> like 80 pounds soaking wet, and now you're just slaying it and crushing all of us adults. Like, all we can hope for is that we can somehow outsmart you with wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but they're just getting faster and better because they're young and they pick it up so quickly. And I I, you know. And it was one of those things, like, if I could rewind time, and be like, hey, Dad, psh, psh, there's this whole USPSA, IDPA, uh, three gun will come eventually. Yeah. You'll challenge, uh, rimfire stuff. There's so many games out there to play, even when uh, when you're young and can't move with a gun, right? No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's amazing, but um, I'm delighted that I had the solid foundation that I had, and uh, mm -hmm. when I was... Uh, 25, 26, I started getting into uh, competitive shooting. Uh, and the years between that, I had gone, and I'm almost embarrassed to say, I had taken a lot of like uber, uber tactical classes. Oh, yeah. sweet. Super tactical ninja. Do you have like a plate carrier? <laughs> I did not. Camo? That was like the next class. Like, you're going to graduate. <laughs> now, next time, you're going to wear a plate carrier and do a ninja roll. <laughs> Nice. So, uh, fun fact, there's actually a ninja training facility right below where I'm sitting right now. It's, I think it's like, I think it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but there's a lot of kids in there and they look like ninjas, but so nice. that, that is like the, the graduation, right? You get your belt, you move up in, in a belt size for you. It'd be a plate carrier. Yeah. Except I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure about this whole thing. A lot of this seems a little overhyped. <laughs> yeah. So and, what drew you to uh, taking those classes? Did you just miss like the, uh, the recreational aspect of shooting or doing something in a um, uh, structured environment or. It really started with a concealed carry. Um, I was ready to make the step towards concealed carry. And so I was like, you know, being raised with a good foundation of firearms knowledge and with my dad being in law enforcement, he's like, listen, he goes, if you start carrying a firearm on your person or in your purse or however you decide to carry it, like, you need to be, you need to have training, like more than what I gave you growing up. Like you need to know about, you know, what happens if you actually have to pull your firearm out in a public setting, like what's your target, what's beyond your target, you know, all of those things that I was like, Oh my God, I never thought about this. <laughs> you know? I was like, what if I shoot a gun inside, inside my house? Like, you know, it was like the valuable lessons that I needed to learn. So um, I love to make jokes and say like, ah, oh, tactical ninja classes, but I did learn a lot. Like I learned that, oh, well, surprisingly a standard wall in a house doesn't necessarily stop bullets. <laughs> yeah. It does in the movies though. You can actually hide behind them. Yeah, it does in the movies. And surprisingly a car door doesn't stop bullets. <laughs> it might cause them to do funny little things, but not. <laughs> Windshield. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> all these things. So, so I went and I sought out classes and got education, and I think that was kind of like the precursor to the shooting sports because I, I've never really been that competitive. Mm -hmm. 
but when I started taking these classes, like I found myself, I was like, mm, not so, not so shabby, you know? <laughs> and I found myself like measuring myself against the other person. I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to shoot faster and I can shoot a little bit more accurately and faster than they are. And, and so I found myself really enjoying it. And I found myself that like, I loved the class, like shooting in the group scenario more than anything. And mm -hmm. I loved talking to the people. It was just, you know, like-minded people. They're all taking the class because they want to have more education. And I just, I found it really fun. And uh, I knew about competitive shooting at, at that time, but I, <laughs> I Do really did That'll get you killed in the streets. I, you know, I, I didn't, I stayed away from competitive shooting because I thought it was a boy sport. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. The, the the guy aspect um, really really intimidated me. But um, if if I were to rewind the person that I was before I got into shooting sports to the person that I am now, it's it's almost night and day. Like you could not pry a word out of me hardly. Like I like doing this. No, not even. It would not. Really? No, I was terrified. I was terrified of talking to people. Uh, and I, I hadn't quite come out of my shell yet. Uh, mm -hmm. and the shooting sports <laughs> was able to do that for me. Um, but yeah, no, uh, at the time I was like, Oh no, that's, that's, that's shooting. I, I would, you know, uh, I would see competitions and, and go and I like watch people sometimes, but I was like, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's like a boy's thing. And I so don't want to, did you, about. did you see that and, and want to do it? And, and, but you I were, I wanted to. No, was, was the boys thing. Do you think that like looking back now with, with the, uh, <clears throat> the gift of time, do you think now that that was an excuse? Like maybe you were intimidated by the, the game or is it legit? Like there's no girls here and I would feel uncomfortable. It, it was kind of a combination of both. So it was like one, there were no girls there. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no girls and uh you know it was always i've always i don't know i've always been one of those girls like i like to respect like a man needs to be a man right and men need their outlet and yeah. so, like i would never be the girl that shows up on boys night like hey i made <laughs> the brownies and oh you're smoking cigars please put those out you know like i never <laughs> want to be that girl, right <laughs> like shows up and ruins things but um i what kind of did it for me was I saw a girl at the match and I saw her with her husband. I was like, huh, well, that's kind of cool. Um, and it was something that it took some courage. So part of it was, I think, uh, and I, I think this, you know, now knowing what I know, I think mm -hmm. a lot of it was in my head, you know, it was my own self doubt, um, you know, just fear of, I think every shooter, every every new shooter before they get into competition, you think everyone's going to be watching you. Right. You literally yeah. think like I'm gonna get up to shoot and everyone's gonna like put down their range bags, they're gonna stop what they're doing and they're going to watch everything that you do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh you know, Matt Kupika calls it um uh or I mean he not calls it, he says that you have to get over your fear of of sucking, but you also have to get over your fear of public speaking which most people would rather die than public speak, right? Because you are literally yeah. standing, in your mind, you're standing up in front of everyone and they're watching everything you do. Yeah. Which, Heather, you figured out the uh, the, the key on that one. <laughs> I did. Oh, gosh. I, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things like, I, I'll tell you, uh, very few people know this. My very first USPSA match that I showed up at, um, about in the first probably five minutes that I was there, I I almost got back in my vehicle and, and drove back home. Really? Yeah. Why, why is it? I wouldn't even mention the shooter. I won't even say who it was. <laughs> and, and I just I I didn't have a thick skin and I I didn't realize like I love the, what I love about the shooting sports now, I didn't realize that they were poking at me, kind of teasing me to try to like get me to lighten up. Oh. I showed up and my, one of my mentors and instructors, uh, he's uh, this, this uh, you know, retired uh, old school force recon Marine. And literally like, like his knees and his joints and stuff were so bad that on like really rainy days, like it would cause him a lot of pain. 
And part of me kind of thinks he didn't think I was going to show up that day to actually shoot. But I drove what was supposed to be like a two hour drive turned into a three hour drive through a rainstorm. And I show up and he's not there. Here's my first match. I drove all this way through this stupid storm. I get there, it's muddy, and the match director and the few shooters that actually showed up through the storm, like the really diehard shooters were like, ah, maybe we should call it, you know? Like it's just dumping rain, it's super miserable. And this one shooter just kind of is like, hey, who are you? And just really starts like, and I was so, introverted at the time he just was kind of like poking at me and being like hey who are you you know you showed up oh your your instructor your mentor didn't show up ha huh? you know and teasing me and i was like in my mind i'm like just get in your car and go back home like <laughs> go back home this is stupid this is so this is a bad idea oh, this is a bad idea this is such a bad idea <laughs> and i literally like as those thoughts were going through um there's this uh, retired, uh, another Marine that was in the area, and he actually met his wife through shooting, and they would always shoot together. And he saw me, and he points at me, he's like, hey, I know you. <laughs> and he comes up, and he's like, hey, I'm sorry, I had a couple matches a while back. He's like, so you're here, like, you're shooting. I'm like, yeah, but I think I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> And he was like, and he invited me to come with, he goes, you know what, you should squad with me, shoot with my wife and I, and we'll just, we'll just, he goes, he goes, you know how to operate a firearm, we're just going to show you a new game, a new, a new way of shooting, and he's like, and you know, if you don't like it, then, you know, roll out, but he's like, you drove all this way, it's like, okay, and uh, his wife is so sweet, and she's like, oh, come on, you know, I don't actually, you know what? And at the time they weren't married. I now remember because I went to their wedding because they had a uh, a zombie three gun or no, sorry, zombie shooter wedding uh, several months down the road. That sounds like fun. Yeah, no, they're they're awesome, and they I don't know if they realize quite what they did. Like just being the way that shooters are, so mm-hmm. warm and friendly, and that that that. Um, that community, that family of shooters that those of us that shoot regularly have come to know, like them just being them, just being like, hey, no, come on, shoot with us, was instrumental in me coming into the shooting sports. And that's great. people like them that, you know, I'm here. <laughs> that That's incredible. And, you know, it, it really is those uh, those first interactions that you have that really set the tone. And I've I've told this story before. So, you know, I, in, sp- in spite of being a, a podcast host, I'm kind of introverted myself. I do spend like a lot of time up in my head. And, yeah. uh, well, my first experience with shooting a match was I reached out to the, uh, uh, match director of like a, cl- a local club match and I called him up and, uh, he started giving me a hard time about like the pistol I had. And, you know, cause I only had a, a 1911, that was a 45. And so he started, uh, you know, making fun of me for the, for having the 45 and, and, uh, you know, said a few swear words and stuff like that, that, uh, um, about, you know, me and my shooting and stuff I was like, bro, we don't even know each other. We've never even spoke like, this is weird. And so then, yeah. uh, I didn't go to that match and I didn't go, uh, shoot for like two years. And, uh, it, really? wow. yeah, isn't that weird? So then it, it took wow. me that long to actually go and try out a match and it was a three gun match. Um, not that particular match that, uh, that I initially called about. And so those guys were like warm and inviting and, you know, welcoming and, you know, they would actually have fun and, and things like that. So when, uh, when faced with new people, some, you know, sometimes like we're trying to get our, our game together, we're trying to, you know, perform to the the best of our ability, or maybe we're trying to find that mod choke that we know is in the bag, but I can't figure it out where it is yeah. but, uh, for, for experienced people. Like just be careful of, of your impression and, and the, uh, you know, the interactions that you have, because that is their impression. Like this is the first time they're here. This is everything that you tell them is going to be their impression of three gun or yeah. USBSA or IDPA or something like that. Well, and it's funny you say that. Cause like the person that I remember that caused me to want to walk away from my first USPSA <laughs> match ended up becoming a good friend later on down the road. Really? <laughs> yes. And I was like, man, you were such a jerk. And he was like, 
a jerk. I was just trying to get you to like come out of your shell because you had your eyes were like this big, you know, and it's like, yeah, you can't do that with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's hard to tell, right? Yeah, like some people, you know, and and um, for me, you know, um, I, I had a great shooting club. Um, North Carolina has a great shooting sports. And so um, Sir Walter Raleigh was the club that I shot at. And it's a surprisingly near Raleigh. Uh, <laughs> who'd have thunk it? Um, <laughs> but like we had this great network of shooters. And so they became like family. And it was just funny because they kind of, helped me grow into a woman um like they really helped me like i always tell you like one of the things i love the most about the shooting sports and what it helped me develop uh my interpersonal skills and you know to be overly the overly talkative person that I am now, <laughs> uh was the fact that you know when uh, you know i always tell you like when you get up to the line and you're the shooter, like people can help you prep your gear beforehand. And, you know, they can help you, you know, prep and design and figure out how you're going to shoot the stage. But when you get up to the line, it's you. Mm -hmm. No one's going to help you at that point. Like maybe if your gun malfunctions terribly or something, but it's, it's all on you. You're pulling the trigger. You're making decisions. If something happens in between start and stop, you've got to assess the problem and figure it out. I mean, if you're a trooper, you're going to, fix the malfunction, you're going to do what it takes, and you're going to get to the end. And for me, it helped me develop a lot of self confidence. I was like, Oh, wow, you know, I can shoot, I can be pretty, um, I can be pretty decent at this. And, and you know what, like, I have to problem solve, I have to problem solve now. And like that, that, you know, uh, confidence in myself that I built through through that network of, you know, it's a, it's a really positive community. It's a, com a positive group of people. And so even when I would suck terribly, I would want to walk off the stage being like, oh my gosh, I did that terrible. And that was a disaster. And did I really used to do my reloads like this? Like, <laughs> give me advice. like people would point out like the positive stuff that I did. And, and it like, it just helped me really develop as a person and, and really gain that self-confidence to, you know, as I, I grew into a woman and grew into, you know, um, having a career and, and, you know, coming to where I am now, it really, um, those shooters, the, the, the ragtag bunch that I used to hang out with, you know, were just like the most amazing people in the world. And I feel like sometimes I don't give them enough thanks. Um, anytime I tell them thank you or try to say, you remember that day when he told me like, it's time to spread your, um, I'll actually say it because I'll embarrass the heck out of him if he ever watches this. But uh, Joseph Parent, we call him Willie Parent. Uh, he, we used to shoot together on a regular basis uh, till he became the, I believe his title is Director of Glock Professional now. Okay. Uh, but we used to shoot together all the time. And I remember one time he came up to me and he has, and I always tell him like, you have to remember how influential the statement was. But I was really nervous and I was shooting a match. I was like, ah. I don't know. I went up and I was like, no, I don't know if I can do this. This is intense. And he told me, he just looked at me, he goes, like, takes a cigarette out of his mouth. And he's like, all right, little birdie, it's time to spread your wings and fly. Like, what? He goes, time to spread your wings and fly. I was like, what does that mean? He was like, you know how the stage goes. Like, do it. I'm like, but I have all these questions. He's like, you know how to walk a stage. He's like, it's time to figure out your stage plan and do it. And it was just, you know, I had such, you know, and such positive mentors and role models that, you know, they would make little statements like that. I was like, you know what? It's time to spread my wings. Like, okay, I can totally do this, you know? And it was, it's been just influential throughout um, my life. I mean, even up to now, like if I have a, a moment of self doubt, like I'll think little thoughts like that, you know, it's time to spread my wings. Like, yeah. it's it's time to to execute and do this. You know? It's pretty. It's pretty amazing how um, the the first of all the confidence that practical shooting can can give you. I see a lot of it in uh, in juniors, like the juniors that I run into on the range are so much easier to talk to than ones you run in the grocery store that are you know bagging your groceries. Uh, and I, I just think like that's 
that's because of the responsibility and the the confidence that practical shooting gives them. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's amazing how like one person can say one thing like that. And just to them, it's like a cast off comment or they, maybe they've said it a hundred times before, but it just resonates with you and something you carry for years. It, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> I started laughing because I'm also thinking about other <laughs> things that he told me one time, but I can't say on camera, um, <laughs> but I remember like, there was still occasionally like the crotchety like guy that would try to come up and tell me like, oh, well, like push up my glasses. I, you should have shot it this way or whatever. And I had totally like I had outshot them. I was faster and more accurate and had scored higher than them. But they'd want to come up and try to critique something. And I remember one time I was bothered by it. And I'll just say, <laughs> look at me and his 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 uh old school Marine Wayne. And he goes, you know, Heather, he's like, next time someone comes up and tries to, you know, talk smack to you about something, just look at him very just nonchalant and just go, go F yourself. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sorry, do what? <laughs> you know, and like at the time I was so, I mean, still I was like introverted growing up and I was like, yeah, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I was like, I can't do that. And then the next time I think uh, we were shooting a stage and he came up and was like, ah, you know, if you had uh, done such and such and not done that mag change, like before that next stop, you could have been a little bit faster. I looked at him and I said, Hey, Willie, go, go, go up yourself. <laughs> He's like, you're not supposed to use it towards me. <laughs> <laughs> that other guy, not me. Yeah. But you know, it was, it was great. Cause it was just one of those things. Like it was, I, I learned so much from the shooters mm -hmm. that I shot with, you know, and they're hilarious and, and it was such good humor. And, you know, and I was, I was, though I was raised around the shooting sports, I was raised very sheltered. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that like witty banter that adults have, I didn't grow up around that. Like I didn't understand that. And so I, uh, you know, learned it in my late twenties where a lot of people would have learned it when they were younger. And it was funny because, you know, even something as, as funny as that was, it, it was also one of those things where I learned not to let people mess with me, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just like, you know, you know what? I'm going to say that other word. But I, you know, I don't really, I don't say that that often. I mean, I do curse, but <laughs> I try not to tell people to go, you know, kick, right. I like to say go kick rocks, right? <laughs> okay, okay. So let me write this down. Don't offer advice to Heather. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, no, on, on that topic. Okay. So this is a, this is an interesting thing. So, um, as, as a female in the sport that is, you know, still, uh, what are we eight years later from when you started still mm -hmm. dominated by men? Do you find that, um, there's a lot of, Oh, and then I got to tell you a funny story about you one time when we were shooting in generation three gun that just came into my head, but do you, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, do you find that, uh, that there's a lot of unwelcome or unneeded advice or like, you know, Hey darling, you know what you ought to do that kind of thing. Is, is that like a huge part of the shooting sports? Cause you know, I, I don't get that as a dude. No, I don't think so. Like, if anything, um, and, you know, it's always one of those things, like, it's always, like, looking back, right? There were times where I remember feeling like, oh, my God, every dude kept coming up. Like, every guy at the match is like, oh, you should do this, and oh, you should do that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I, I could put on my shoes in the morning and dress myself. Like, <laughs> like I'm fine, you know, but what I... And I think it's a lot of misconceptions, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you yourself are feeling self-conscious and then people are giving you a lot of advice, then sometimes you can miscommunicate what they're doing. Yeah. And I, it is generally from, and, and this is something that uh, when I'm teaching a class of all women, I tell them I'm like, they are not trying to give you a hard time. They're literally super excited to see you. Like most men on the range, like I have, I can count on one hand in the past eight years, how many dudes were ever just being turds, honestly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like really, like most of them, even like the oldest crotchety is just like, hey, you know, you, your mag pouch sits too far forward or, or has like some common, generally, they literally are just trying to give you advice because they want you to do better. And 
uh, most of them are excited to see you there. Mm -hmm. Because I think that a lot of men in the shooting sports have realized what we've all come to realize um, uh, that it's not a sexist thing, that it, the more women that you get involved in the shooting sports is thus going to be more juniors involved in the shooting sports. And the more that you can get more, you know, people from different backgrounds, more females, more juniors involved in it, mm -hmm. the more, the more of a likelihood that we will be able to protect the second amendment because it's those younger generations. And still there are plenty of women raising children and if they are anti-gun and they have bad experiences or negative experiences with firearms, that is going to translate down to their children. And so if you can get a woman, even though it's going to cost you a lot more when, when your household starts having two people shooting, <laughs> <laughs> like it's one of those things that if you can have the wife on board, if, if, if the female is on board with what you're doing, then one, she's not going to give you a bunch of flack for going out and shooting. <laughs> so you're going to go and enjoy your weekend a little bit more, but <laughs> And most likely she's going to want to come with you. But I, generally I've seen it as enthusiasm and it's just kind of like anything, you know, if, if, if I wasn't shooting and let's just say I was, I don't know, um, you know, mountain biking or doing anything, it would be the same thing. Like guys would be like, Oh, there's a new person on the range and what, or new, new person on the track. And it's mostly like a male dominated thing. They're going to try to give you help because mm -hmm. Uh, I think that like with shooters, they all, we all like to feel like we know something. Yeah. Deep down, deep down it feels That's good. For sure. You know, to, to feel like you know something and to be able to tell that to a new person and have them listen to you and then do that, then you feel really good. Yeah. Um, so let, I, me, uh, let me show you a little thing I like to call reverse Neil. You're going to love this one. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a good example. Reverse Neil, right? It's something simple that uh, all the experienced shooters teach uh, the new shooters. Yeah, so, yeah. But it seems well, like magic. Well, you know, it's funny uh, because like, so, you know, before Eric and I ever started dating and um, long ago, he actually was one of my shooting mentors, like him and uh, he and uh, several of this ragtag group of guys. <laughs> And it was funny because they were pointed out to me uh, because my mentor said, he goes, listen, he's like, everyone is going to want to tell you like shoot this way and do this. And he goes, a lot of it, don't listen to them. Yeah. A lot of it's really <laughs> yeah. wrong. Yeah. He's like, just let it go in one ear and out the other smile and be nice. And just like, be like, Oh, thank you. And then just like delete that from your mind. And he said, that group over there, he goes, listen to everything. Like, like if they talk to you about shooting, like, like listen to it. Anything else, don't talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny because like they were, I remember going up and I'm like, those guys, the guys that look, you know, they're young guys from, you know, generally young military guys that look like they've had a good weekend and uh, went up and <laughs> I was like, uh, I'm going to shoot a stage and I don't know what I'm doing. And it was great because like they treated me like kid sister. And I was like scared. I was like the most scared of them because like half of them were wearing like multi-cam pants and just, I don't know. They just, they were super intimidating. And I remember like the first time I walked up, uh, there's a guy, um, I already was saying his name. No, TK. <laughs> so anybody <laughs> ever met TK, uh, TK is a great storyteller and he's hilarious. Well, he was telling a very animated story and he was cursing like while he's telling the story because he's got the guys are sitting around, he's telling the story. And I, I just like kind of like ease up quietly because I have a question and I get up behind him and he turns around and he's like, oh, coming, ah, uh, ah, uh, like, no, it says several curse words. And I'm like, Heather, I mean, oh, shoot. I mean, I mean, damn it. I mean, ah, I need to stop cursing. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, it's literally, I was like tripping over himself to stop cursing. And they're all just like, what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Can we help you? <laughs> yeah. Just like, uh, you know, and they were great. They were like, oh, well, and, and like, here's what'll make you a better shooter. Here's where you're wasting time. Like this'll, this'll make you more efficient. This'll make you better. And so I just, had this amazing group of people to help me and they weren't just like oh great we got the chick on the range they were actually just like yeah yeah just treated me kind of like one of the guys and and that you know as i kept on shooting treated me like kid sister and i was like great because i felt comfortable when i saw like 
I had my mentor there. I had these groups of people that I knew, like I could go up and ask about a stage plan, or if I had a problem with my gun, I could ask them. And I knew that they knew more than I did and would give me the best advice possible. Um, and I think, you know, it's instrumental. That's why I have, I have such a love for, for the shooting sports in general. It's cause it's just, you know, it's an amazing group of people, uh, across the board, you know, and I would shoot with, I would shoot with, uh, this group that we, our age range went from, I think uh, several times I was the youngest and, you know, like, like mid twenties to, we had eighties, like we had the guy wearing his support socks up to his knees and he shot open because that's all he could see anymore was a red guy. <laughs> I love that guy. Yes, it was great. He he always loved to wear tank tops and was always hilarious because like, you know, he's wearing tank tops and he shouldn't be wearing tank tops, but you know, he's like had his tank top and his tall shorts like up halfway up his waist with his like support socks and it was just great because it was like this great group like of crazy people all together sharing one passion. That's one thing that I really like about the uh, like the club match scene is that there there is like a huge diversity of of people and of walks of life and uh, people with gear people people with different focuses on the game. Uh, you know, there's always the guy who's like training for zombies or whatever, and then there's you know the dude that's that's eighty with the uh, the uh, tank tops and stuff like that. The yeah. And it's, it's so much fun to be able to shoot with all those different types of people. And you're all sharing, like you said, one, one love and one joy and, and you're having fun together doing, you know, celebrating your second amendment rights. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's one of those things that just like, there's so many times and, and I think it's great. Like this is the first year I wasn't able to be a part of the DC project. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was um, part of the original 12 that uh, went with went, went with Die to do like the test run in D.C. to, you know, educate our legislators about the Second Amendment. But it's the shooting sports is always something that I use to talk about when I'm talking to my congressman or to my senator. And, and so it seems like, man, if you only knew, if you knew yeah. this amazing group of people and some of us have very, very different political views. But the one thing that brings us together is a shooting sports and, you know, and it's so diverse, like the group of people, like you've got, you know, the, the SF guy, you've got the bookkeeper, the accountant, the IT guy, you've got this, like this mix of people from all different, you know, you know, different um, backgrounds, ethnicities, sexes, mm -hmm. like, and we, we all come together and enjoy this one, one thing. And, if anything, it helps us all realize how to work work together. Uh, and, you know, that's always something that I, at least with my North Carolina legislators, I'm like, I always tell them, like, do you realize North Carolina for, like, the longest time has been, like, the mecca of the shooting sports? Like, for, like, I mean, there was actually, like, one point in time, I was like, you know, actually, even now, you know, you, you can't go a weekend without a major or a, at least a well-filled, at least like 100 competitor match going on. Right. Or PSA or long range or three gun, there's something going on at all times. Like, do you realize this is going on in your in your state? Like, these are your constituents? Yeah, and that's one of the things that we talked about when, when uh, you're on the show talking about the DC project. We were in uh, uh, New Mexico at the NRA Whittington Center. Yeah. And the... Uh, the climate in, in North Carolina is crazy. Like you guys have like 150 people at your club matches, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're significant. Yeah. We have to cap them off and not allow people in, which sucks. <laughs> like it's yeah. a match and that's all I wanted to do this Saturday, but I registered late and you know, they, they generally try to let people in, but I mean, it's just, it's just been that way. And I, you know, it's part of why I've stayed living in North Carolina for so long is because I mean, if I didn't have to work so much <laughs> yeah. was when I work, it wasn't working as much, but I would literally go from weekend to weekend. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to shoot a long range match here. I'm going to shoot a USPSA match here. We shoot an IDPA match the next weekend. And I'll shoot three gun the next one, you know? And, and they were all good matches. Like it wasn't like your, your like hodgepodge, just like half ass thrown together match. It's a yeah. well done match. And, um, 
you know, I, I consider myself lucky that my introduction to the shooting sports was in a state that had such a good influence. Definitely. Okay. So you, you, uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. You got into, into the shooting sports, you found like kind of your, your little cadre of, uh, of people that are going to be helping you through it. So when, when did it turn from just a, a pistol match to uh three gun? <laughs> uh, honestly, it was when our, our uh, local Sir Walter Raleigh match, which was uh, my most looked forward to USPSA match of the month, because it was always like, that was the one that our, our monthly USPSA match was like a level two USPSA match. Like we would, they would huh. out at 120, 130 shooters and you'd shoot six stages. And that was back, you know, we're still scoring on paper. Oh you know, God. Imagine that. <laughs> and yeah. That's and it was horrible all day. It was like paper. You had to, you finished around four or five o'clock and then you waited for the paper results to be scored, you know? Uh, but yeah, you notice people started disappearing and, uh, Tar Hill three gun had started and, uh, everybody's like, ah, they're like they're shooting that three gun stuff. <laughs> oh, dude, that sounds terrible. You know, <laughs> the way like some of the, some of the guys would talk about three gun. I was like, Ooh, it must be bad. <laughs> way- I bet those people are mean. So- yeah. They're like those three gunners. And it was actually, uh, it was, you know, Eric and TK and a lot of those guys that were like, generally we would see at every match. So they weren't coming anymore. And the match, it was like the next weekend. Cause it just happened at the time that Tar Hill three gun was coinciding with um, Sir Walter Raleigh's USPSA match. And so the next one, I like saw him, he showed up at like the one that the USPSA match we had on the second weekend. Cause we, like I said, we have a USPSA match like every weekend, uh they're right. like, oh yeah it's like this three gun thing and it's super fun and then they started talking about the gear and I'm like ooh, yeah i really don't have all that stuff so <laughs> i'm like i have a pistol and i have pistol mags and a pistol belt like i can't just like, <laughs> up and, like now i gotta get optics and rifles and a shotgun and shotgun stuff and and that was, I mean, that's back when people were like still uh, loading, uh, you know, just like thumbing them in there or doing. Yeah, the weekend quad load yeah. or weekend load four. There we go. Yeah, like the classic, just like thumbing in like lo- uh, load fours. And uh, yeah, I think it was actually just before twin loading had come in, come into effect. Like twin, imagine that, right? Twins didn't yeah. exist yet. <clears throat> that's when I started. I, I actually bought. Um, I think they were AP customs and they had like the eight, yeah. the two stacks of four. And so you grab four and shuffle them in there and grab four and shuffle them in there. Those are the caddies that I started with. And I, yeah. I remember a, a pal of mine got uh load twos shortly thereafter. And, yeah. and I looked at him and, and I'm watching him load and I'm like, you know, it's not that much faster. And yeah. then just after a while, he just blazed right by me. <laughs> yeah. Like, Oh, I guess it is faster. Yeah, it, it's a, it's amazing. And so it was enough that like people kept saying, ah, you know, just come down and try it. And like, I remember, I don't remember what happened or, or why, but I ended up going down and shooting my first three gun match and I giggled like throughout. Like, <laughs> <laughs> did like, you, did you uh, go out and buy gear? Did you borrow gear or what'd you do? Uh, it was a mix. So I had some gear and I was borrowing gear. Um, and you know, and unfortunately I knew enough people, uh, but you know, it was like, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing with the shotgun. I was actually scared to death of shotgun. I hated shotgun the most of everything. What? Yeah. Oh yeah. I hated shotgun. I know. It's funny. Cause I love shotgun now. Like shotgun is like, <laughs> I'm like, please just give me a shotgun. Forget everything. <laughs> Shotgun. But at the time I was like, Ooh, no. Cause I was like, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Like I was like, but you know, the most I had shot shotgun was like, you know, shooting at, you know, moving animals, flying animals most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was just like, Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I just keep pulling the trigger. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I laugh. I remember just like laughing like the whole time I was shooting. I was like, I am doing terrible, but this is like the most fun I've ever had while shooting. Like, <laughs> it was a good. Awesome. I think Carla Herzig, which I mean, 
I don't know if she still shoots anymore, um, but you know, Carla Herzig uh, was one of the first people I shot with. And I mean, I remember looking at her and I'm like, oh my God, whoa. Like, and, you know, she's like super CrossFit chick. And like, I was watching her go through, I'm like, dude, that's, that's badass. I was like, that's awesome. You know, like I want to be like that, you know? <laughs> And yeah, I was hooked. I was hooked for match one. It was it was the most fun I had ever had. And mm, I say this delicately, it's a different crowd. Yeah, it, it definitely is. So how would you describe the the difference in the crowd? Uh, I used to tell people I was kind of like, uh, if you compared like USPSA to three gun, like USPSA was like, um, uh, khakis and loafers and uh, three gun was like board shorts and flip flops. You know? yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's a pretty decent uh, analogy. I like that one. And it's funny because like, I love USPSA. I actually love all the shooting sports as much crap as people give IDPA. I love IDPA for it being IDPA. Like it has mm -hmm. so many good skill sets with IDPA, but there are just different crowds. And my first three gun match, I was like, Ooh, this is like the wild, wild west, you know, <laughs> like, uh, it was kind of, you know, I felt like it was, um, more responsibility. Um, cause I mean, it's multitasking at its finest is now it's not just one gun and one gun bag, you know, it's, it's, you know, three managing three throughout a stage. It's, it's truly multitasking at its, at its, at its finest. And, I just, I don't know. It's just like, it was just a cool group of people. And, you know, and, and I don't even know if I can say this on the show, but it was like the first time I shot a match, like once the match was done and all the guns were put away, like someone threw down their tailgate and opened up a Yeti and pulls out, you know, pulls out a beer. I'm like, we can have beer. This is okay. Can we do this? Like, oh boy. I'm like expecting like a, like somebody to like jump out of the bushes and be like, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> like, <you can't. laughs> and I was like, and I'm like, yeah, you want a Corona? I'm like, you mean, so we're just going to like have a beer now and hang out. Like, that's weird. You know, <laughs> I was like, cause I was so used to like shooting the match and then generally leaving. Yeah. It's just great because it was like, once everything was set up, once the ROs were done and targets were put away and the match was complete, then it was like, you know, open up the cooler, have a beer, set up a lawn chair, sit on the tailgate, and then sit there and tell stories. And it was great because it was like, you know, I and I think that's a lot of times what draws people to three gun is it's like this sense of community. Yeah. And it's like, very, ah. very social sport. Yeah, it's like now I'm sitting on a tailgate with all these cool people and they're telling all these great stories and I'm laughing to like keep wiping tears from my eyes and like, yes, I will come back. I will come back time and time again and I have to tell all my friends, you know, like I have to bring more and more people into this because, you know, if 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 USPSA wasn't quite their, you know, quite their thing, may, maybe the three gun crowd is there. Yeah. You know? might might be their thing and you know that that's one of the great things about the shooting sports is there's so many different kinds even if you just stick in action shooting that you can find something uh that you like you know there's people that you know i love shooting rifle but i don't like running over things and jumping on things and i hate the shotgun well hey there's this you know prs there's mm -hmm. nrl there's all these different options for you to uh to get out there and shoot and then there's the guys that you know, want to buy one pistol when they're 29 years old and then shoot that exact same pistol for the next 35 years and become a master at that one thing. So there's something for everybody. I always tell people, I was like, um, cause I actually started with IDPA. Mm -hmm. I told people it was like, it was like the gateway drug, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and you shoot IDPA and you're like, eh, it's fun. I like it. And then you hear about this USPSA and they're like, Hey, all those rules, you know, have all those crazy draw from concealment, can't drop the mag. You can drop the mag anytime you want. You, know? <laughs> you don't have to wear a vest. Yeah. And you're like, maybe I'll go shoot this USPSA badge. And, you know, you go and shoot it and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> what and else you got? Then you like hear about three gun a few years later and they're just like, mm, maybe I'll go try that. And then actually uh, three gun after shooting three gun made me go, 
hmm, I like shooting rifle. I actually like shooting a long range. Ooh, I'm going to go shoot PRS. And, you know, go and shoot a PRS match and realize how many times I could try to pull the trigger and not, not rack a bolt. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then they started the PRS gas gun series. And it was like, ah, well, if you didn't like bolt guns, but you still want to shoot serious long range, now we have PRS gas gun division. And it's like, they keep setting stuff up for people that it's like, okay, well, what do you like? What do you want to try? Or like, um, I always recommend like steel challenge for new shooters. Yeah. Hey, you're brand new. You don't have all the rigs and all the stuff. Show up and shoot, um, uh, shoot steel challenge, man. You can just take the gun straight out of the bag. As long as you have a couple mags, you can shoot to their heart's content, you know? And, uh, always always don't even have to walk anywhere. Yeah, no walking, nothing. no reset. Yeah, and you're generally done in like two hours. So, so that's, yeah, that, that's like the uh, the appointment shooting, right? Like you just get your tea yeah. time and go there. No, re- no reset. Done in two yeah. hours. Nothing. I used to go. Uh, they would hold one. They used to hold one up at uh, Woody's Hunt and Rifle Club, and I would go. And they would hold it. It was like it would start at like five thirty. Uh huh. It would start at five thirty, and you were done by seven thirty. Like by the time the sun was going down, like we would work through like five squads through five stages of steel challenge. And it was great. Cause like, ah, now I'm home in time for dinner and got like my Wednesday, like fun shooting session in. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Good place to, good thing to do after, uh, after work. Yeah. Uh, well, stretch. Heather, so you've had, you've had like quite the, the uh, progression over the last bunch of years and yeah. We're we're skipping so much in between, but I, I uh, we need to talk about the world shoot. So, yes. you just went to the 2018 uh, IPSC Shotgun World Shoot in France, mm-hmm. and uh, so you started out running for, running from the 30 out six, hiding in the truck, falling asleep. Here you are at the world shoot. There's a lot of space in between, but let's talk about that world shoot experience. Oh my gosh. Like, can we just like roll back a three weeks and put me back into France? Cause it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, oh gosh, I can't even, it was, it's one of those things like you almost feel bad when you come home and you're talking to someone you're just like, eh, it's cool. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like you got to downplay how awesome it was. Yeah. Or at least at work, right? Like at work, they're like, yeah. France. I'm like, oh, it was, it was cool. You know? <laughs> Just uh, represented my country, no big deal. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was cool. You know, I got to hang out with 30 different countries, 800 competitors, you know, in France. <laughs> Crazy. But it, was, it was epic. I mean, truly epic. And uh, to be able to go this year uh, was extraordinary because I had the opportunity to go, uh, you know, back in uh, 2015. And I didn't go. And I have regretted it <laughs> ever since. Uh, and I've had people come up countless times and say, oh, why didn't you go to the world shoot? And I was like, oh, well, and I would always have some sort of excuse. And what I don't, didn't really want to tell people was I was scared. I was scared to go shoot F6 shotgun. It seemed intimidating and traveling overseas seemed really intimidating. The whole process just seemed like, mm, no. <laughs> yeah way out of my like traveling internationally with firearm nah that's that's cool like it's outside of your comfort zone a little bit but you know i've also had quite a significant amount of time to grow in the shooting sports since then and realize that you know as long as you get your paperwork in in order um things generally aren't too bad and so um i mean like knock on wood for next time but my process going and coming was super smooth really like, the, the worst problem I had was like flight delays from Delta just being Delta. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Um, and, you know, the process of getting my firearm ready, you know, um, we we started, uh, I don't know if Diana uh, uh, Muller started it. At, somebody started a 2018 um, Ipsic World Shotgun Forum. Mm-hmm. And so it was great because we had people that had just shot the uh, the pistol world shoot on there giving tips and advice on like, Hey, this is what you need. This is what form you need to get your gun through. And, and just everybody was like sharing all their tips and tricks. So it was kind of like, Oh, cool. Just like read through this. Okay. Get that form, go do that. Like, cool. You know, yeah. and so it actually made the process 
I mean, really actually pretty stinking easy. Um, you know, and, and uh, I actually laughed. I was actually really uncomfortable because most of us, like when we arrived in France, I don't know if I should say this, but they did, they did not check our firearm. They're like going through some girl's purse, like throwing stuff this way. And I'm like, hey, I got a gun case. Like gun typed in firearm into Google Translate. And, was like, <laughs> 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 and the guy just looked at me and was like, yeah, go. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Uh, you don't you don't need you don't need to check this oh, okay cool okay <laughs> just like I'm gonna go now like gonna go roll out and uh, grab my Peugeot and drive off now <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah France was amazing uh, yeah yeah the people were awesome really yeah Oh yeah. So, um, I did, I did stuff. Well, I flew out by myself. Um, I know a lot of people flew out in groups or had other mm -hmm. people, but I was like, yeah, I'm going to fly out. Cause I also had another agenda. Um, when I first got there to, uh, go and visit, uh, Epinal American cemetery so that I could, um, do a little ceremony for my great, great uncle who was MIA, um, KIA MIA in world war two. Huh? And there was a memorial for him. So I was like, well, you know, I'll fly out and I can get into Paris and then I can spend the day exploring Paris. And the next day when I just, instead of traveling straight down uh, to Chateauroux, I can drive four and a half hours out to the cemetery uh, and memorial and visit his, his site and, you know, pay tribute and then drive down. So uh, I ended up, uh, running a, I did an Airbnb. And so I had like a high rise, like 19th floor apartment with this amazing French Polish couple that I'm pretty sure she thought I was a, uh, an assassin. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> I think she thought I was an assassin because it's, it's like central Paris and I've got like the tiniest car in the world. And like my gun case almost had to like hang out the window kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, You're on the 19th floor. She's always looking out the windows. Yeah. And so like I like circle the block multiple times when I get there and I'm like, oh, I just need to get the gun case upstairs and then I can go explore Paris because I, I can sleep anywhere. So I had slept the whole nine hours to Paris. And uh so I got there, I was super fresh and I'm like, oh, let's go see <laughs> stuff. And so I'm just like, I just need to get my shit, sorry, my stuff <laughs> in the apartment. And so I had to park uh, about four blocks down from the place I was staying. So I am rolling down the streets of Central Paris, <laughs> like Pelican case, or sorry, uh, Patriot case in one hand. <laughs> I've got Patriot case in one hand, big giant suitcase in the other, like my backpack just looking just ridiculous. And I've got people staring like crazy. I'm just like, Sorry, excuse me. Oh, bonjour. You know, just. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to keep taking breaks and like stopping and like rolling my case up and just like slumping down on top of it. Going, okay, let's go. <laughs> Roll the thing. <laughs> and uh, finally got it up there. And like the girl looks at me, she goes, What is that? And I said, uh, well, I thought about lying, you know, I'm like, it's a guitar. So documents. A lot of documents. Golf clubs. And I said, oh, I was a firearms case. I told her I was here for the world shotgun shoot. And she was like, we have guns here, you know? And it was just amazing. And she just kind of really looked at me very, she was just super polite. Very, very, very polite. Uh, well, yeah, but she probably she just, thought you were going to kill her. So of course she was, she was polite. Like, oh, she's like, so like, did you rent the place because of the views? And I'm like, yeah, actually I did. I'm not like, thinking. <laughs> But I'm like, yeah, you've got like a perfect view. And, and <laughs> like, I guess she had told her husband that I had a gun. And um, in the morning when I woke up, he actually like greeted me with coffee. And it was, but it was kind of like the suspicious coffee. He was kind of like, 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 well, hello. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, like gave me, he's like, good morning. Give me a cup of coffee. And he's like, so I hear you have a gun. <laughs> Uh, but no, they were great. And it was just cool. I got to have, you know, like a, I like to throw myself into a community. So like even with three gun, 
um, Diana and Lena, the whole, the Micklet gang, everybody had introduced me to Airbnb, you know, several years ago and I've been hooked ever since. And so oh, yeah. whether I'm stateside or overseas, like I try to throw myself in and, uh, yeah, it was great. I got to have like the whole Airbnb experience. And when I got to Chateau, I actually rented a little apartment in downtown Chateau. So a lot of people were staying in chateaus, but I, I stayed by myself and rented because it was like the upstairs apartment of this old, it's the oldest street in Chateau. And so I had this like great little apartment to myself. Uh, and it was just, it was super cool. It was amazing. I, I can't even say it. it was like the people were cool. The city was amazing. <laughs> uh international sounds pretty awesome international competition is great uh yeah so let, let's talk about that so the the uh the international competitions the ipsc worlds they're like big deals right they yes. treat them almost like the olympics with you know ceremonies really elaborate so what was that experience like uh you know honestly at first it was a little intimidating uh because when i got there like I was thinking I was just gonna roll through and do stage walkthroughs. I'm like, hey, I'm here early. I'm gonna go do my stage walkthroughs. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the roped line? You do not cross the roped off line. You do not step foot. They have that at each stage, they have a uh, covered little awning with, you know, uh, concrete, um, you know, floor and or, or, or spot, little pad. And it was like, you do not cross the roped off portion and you do not step foot off of the concrete to walk stages like for you walking stages you get to walk them from the outside so you can walk to the far left you can walk to the far right try to see what you can uh but so it's quite different from what we do in three gun like we will go up and we'll knock shit over set it back up and you know mess with things and see you know pace things off so i mean that's completely different so what was that like not uh, being able to do your normal walkthrough routine it was one of those things that I was like, man, I really wish I had figured that out ahead of time. But it was also one of those things like, it wouldn't have mattered because it was like, what would it, what good would it have done me ahead of time? Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was just different. And so um, I found though that uh, very much like you know shooting in the states, you you would come up to a stage and you see lots of different shooters there. And everybody's kind of like, oh, well, did you see that one target? No, I didn't see that one target. Oh, we'll see that one over there. And so everybody's kind of helping each other out. Um, granted, you know, there are some competitors that because they treat it like they're Olympics, they're very quiet. Uh, they're very, you know, write quietly on their notebook or video and then keep stuff to themselves because, mm -hmm. you know, for some of them, you know, some of the different countries, you know, they are, that is all they do. Like they are a representative of their country and that is their stage plan. And that is not a plan to share with anybody else. It is do what it takes to win, you know? And it was interesting to seeing kind of the different people, but in general, everybody was, it was, I don't know, it was kind of like almost like shooting a three gun match at home. Just the comp just a whole lot more competitors, <laughs> uh, longer stages and the rules, you know, I had heard a lot of false things or <clears throat> I there, they weren't false. It was like everyone heading into the match. We were all super uh, nervous about um, as far as um, breaking 90 degrees with our uh, with our shotguns. And so a lot of us had been told that, you know, at other matches in the past that if the muzzle essentially rises above the berm. Right. That's that was a DQ. Uh, but when I first showed up, oh, it was great. I love them so much. They have like gun check, right? So you like go in, you get all your registration, then you bring your guns over and they do a full inspection. They measure the barrel, they measure from the stock to the barrel. They look everything over on your gun to make sure that it all, it meets all the, uh, IPSC standards. Mm -hmm. I was super nervous. I'm standing there I'm like, oh boy, you know, they're like going everything and, and the guy, uh, the South African gentleman that was going through everything, he was kind of like, hey, relax a little bit. You can smile. And I'm like, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> you know, and it was. Uh, <laughs> you look all suspicious. <laughs> You're trying to get away with something. I was just like nervous. I'm like, oh, no. You know, the whole, like, like, I hope. I mean, obviously, I know my gun's going to make spec, but it's always that just like, it's nervous. It's like going through oh, TV yeah. or something. You're just kind of like, oh. Uh, I don't have drugs on me, but I'm going to act like it. 
<laughs> and so like they're inspecting everything and and they were just really really nice and it was um uh, the south african gentleman and this greek lady and i said hey i said well i said you guys have been so helpful like i have a few questions and i asked about you know as far as my muzzle i said well, i've been really concerned i said is if I reload and it my muzzle just slightly goes upward at say 20 degrees, is that gonna send me home? And he goes, no, 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 no. He's like, that's some matches. Like, and and it and turns out like with Ipsic, like some of the matches, depending on where they're located and what country, and depending if they have shorter berms, right. then they're very strict about it. Or they're very strict about it. Like if your gun is loaded with buck and slug, that's where they're really worried about it. Uh, and they were, you know, what they were very concerned about was they're like, it's not so much the loading. They're like, it's if your finger is in the trigger guard and you have brought the gun out of your face and you're loading and you have your finger in the trigger guard and that that can cause problems. And so it was just kind of familiarizing yourself with the different rules. But it was just like showing up at a three gun match you've never shot at before that might have a different rule set. It was like, oh. I asked them, they gave me as many answers as possible. And then I asked other, I asked other ROs that were there. Uh, and there was a uh, Swedish lady that was super, super helpful, really nice. And she was like, yeah, here's the things to do and don't do. And, and this is how to progress forward. And they were just, everybody was so helpful. Like all the ROs were amazing and, and informative. And, uh, and then actually, as we started shooting, it was like, you know, like I was um, with Team USA, we were shooting uh, with the lady, with the um, lady, the Russian open team and the uh, French team. Uh huh. And it was great. I mean, and, it and was, for, uh, for people that don't know, you're on the on the U.S. open team, right? So we have three ladies open teams all shooting together on the same squad. Yeah, and so. And really, as far as teams, like we were the the contenders, right? Like, and and um, at first it was kind of funny because all of us were pretty quiet to start, you know. And and, and the Russian ladies, they are they're all extremely professional, and mm -hmm. you know you can tell they take their shooting very very seriously. Because I'm someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's their job. Oh, okay. Many of them, that is what they do on it. And they do nothing else. They shoot and they train and they have been running this platform of shotgun since, since the beginning of their shooting career. And we had the French ladies and it was, it was different. It was like a different vibe. Cause like the Russian ladies were um, very, very, um, you know, focused and, and professional and the French team, they were very, focused and professional, but they're also like, they're a little bit more friendly and just kind of like, welcome to France. And like, they were great. Uh, I was actually telling someone like, I would go and drink wine with all of them. They were, <laughs> they were, they were so sweet and they were super helpful. And it was great. Cause like at first, like everything's kind of like, you're a little bit nervous. Cause it's like, you're like I'm team USA and we're here because we plan on winning and uh yeah. this, this <laughs> and, is this is awkward we're uh sworn mortal enemies and yeah. uh here we are on the battlefield <laughs> yeah and it was kind of funny because it was like as as like after like the first couple stages you or uh, the first stage i have to tell you the first thing that threw me off is they clap like oh yeah yeah it's, I mean, it's like an awkward golf clap it's like oh is it a courtesy clap yeah yeah and so like but if you do really badly, they don't clap. <laughs> like if your state plan goes to shit, it is just the worst silence. And so <laughs> like the first stage, like they shot and I did something well. It was like, I'm like, are they freaking clapping? Like, okay, <laughs> cool. And then, you know, the stage that it just goes to hell in a hand basket and you're just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, like <laughs> it becomes a clown show. It is just like when the uh, you know the RO standing there and tells you to unload and show clear. I mean, it is just like you could hear a pin drop. And you're just like, oh wow, no claps. That That's how you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it yeah, was, you don't even have to turn around and be like, did I do good, guys? <laughs> no, you just know. No, and you're just like, oh man. But it was it was really really a cool experience um our ladies open team uh so it was uh myself uh sky killian uh claudia vadanas and uh lanny barnes 
And so we had a pretty epic ladies team and um, we really enjoyed shooting together. Um, And, you know, I feel like, you know, we took the challenges that were thrown at us and did the best that we could with them. And, and um, I don't know, I, I'm just, I tell people constantly, and it's always one of those things like, you're like, oh, that's so cheesy. But like, I am so honored to have shot with the ladies that I shot with. Um, I learned so much and I just have to say Claudia's family. So her dad is Jojo mm-hmm. and like, Jojo is well known in IPSC. Like right. I feel like and, everybody knows him. And Jojo was on the the men's open team. Yeah. He was on the men's open team. He's been shooting Epsic for a long time. And like he was like like Claudia's family, like her whole family was there. And they were so helpful. They're like, okay, well, don't do this and do this. And these are the rules. And like, hey give me your, they were all like, give me your phone. I'll take video of you. And then like her dad would walk up and hold our gun. So you like, he would hold our shotgun so we could walk the stage like one last time. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm like, what do you mean you're going to hold my gun? I'm like, Oh, cool. Like, like, you know, like they were just great. And they were just like, Oh, here, let me hold your gun. And Hey, uh, her mom was like, let me, let, give me your camera and I'll video you. And it was just, it was just a really, really cool experience. And we had, and an epic team and and um gosh i I, i'd shoot with those girls any day like they're it was amazing (laughs) how cool is that that you know it's it's great when you get put together i mean because you you guys from all different areas of the country right so sky's from texas lanny's from colorado um Mm -hmm. i think claudia is like either california or nevada or something like that and then you're up in north carolina so it's it it's cool to be able to come together as you know americans on the the u.s ladies team in france and and work together like that yeah and then you had a positive experience that's awesome yeah we we had a great experience uh we were silver uh so we were the second place team Very nice uh, who, was, who was first russia russia okay yep uh so you know it's funny because i shooting open division was was a huge uh jump for me that was that was definitely it is a far different uh obviously far different shotgun than what i'm used to shooting right so let's let's talk about that so before um i was chatting with the uh the dissonant arms dudes at the nra annual meeting which is i guess a couple weeks before the uh, shotgun world shoot Mm -hmm. i didn't realize what a uh, a severe disadvantage a tube gun has in IPSC in open division. Um, you're limited to 10 rounds in the magazine on, on box fed guns. Um, I'm not sure what the, uh, the limits are on, on tube guns, but when you talk about a reload that you can perform in, you know, a second and a half versus, you know, stuff in quad loads, that's going to take you forever or big sticks or anything. It's a huge disadvantage. So, yeah. It's almost a foregone conclusion that the uh, the open teams now are going to be shooting box uh, shotguns. So quite the difference from what you normally shoot in three gun, which is a uh, Benelli M2, I'm assuming. How was that transition to uh, to the Vepper platform? And, and I know you shot a dissonant arm shotgun. So what was that mm-hmm. transition like? So, you know, it was one of those things that um, so. Uh, when they were picking the teams, you know, I had actually, I had registered for every division, but open (laughs) 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 like great, cool. Uh, I can shoot manual and run a Benelli supernova. I'll shoot modified and just, you know, trick out my M2. Um, and I pretty much, I knew that with the standard, uh, division that they were going to pick the ladies that had shot before because Mm -hmm. they had won it the year before they're amazing shooters. So obviously they're going to get priority for the slots, but so those shooters for people that following along at home, those are Di Muller, uh, Becky Ackley, right? Lena Michalek. Yep. Okay. And Katie Francis. Katie Francis. Thank you. I knew there was a fourth, like, God, I'm drawing a blank here. Thank you. Yep. And so, uh, they had, uh, you know, when, when I got my invitation to the world shock and shoot, they said, yeah, you know, we want issue open. I'm like, Oh, Cool. Uh, hmm. Uh, so we we only have standard and open. Great. That is that's a great choice. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, I you know honestly I wasn't ha- I wasn't ecstatic about it because they didn't pick something that a uh, platform that I was comfortable with. 
But I had, um, you know, wrote back and said, you know, um, I want to do what it takes to represent Team USA well. And so if we're going to have an open team, then then hell yeah. Then I don't know what it's going to take, but I'm going to get an open shotgun. So my first thought is, okay, cool. I'll hit up Mark Roth. I'll run an X-Rail. You know, I'll, I'll run six. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever. And then started talking to people. They're like, yeah, no, Heather, to shoot open in Ipsic, you have to run a MagFed shotgun. Like, right. Plain and simple. Like for you to be competitive and not embarrass yourself or embarrass the country, like like you just have to run that platform. That is what every competitor will be running a mag fed shop. Mm. Like, well, <laughs> and, and to be uh, to be perfectly clear, um, you can run a tube shotgun. You can run an X rail, but the <laughs> rules just have like a massive disadvantage in in them to where it doesn't make sense to run anything else other than a box shotgun, right? No, because even with the box, uh, even with the mag fed shotgun, even though you can run, you know, you, they have 25 round mags and we were mm -hmm. all running 12 round. Most of us were running uh, 12 round mags, but we had to download them to 10. Right. And for anybody that shoots um, IPSC or shoots USPSA, it was like shooting production division, but with an open gun. Right. <laughs> and so... But, you know, even with it being downloaded to 10, I mean, your mag changes are so quick. You know, the time it would take me to load 10 rounds, you know, as 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 confident as I am in my loading skills, because of the way the stages are built, you, like in a three-gun match, you will have that time, mm -hmm. or have that space where you're running to the next position that you can really have all that time to load. This, not so much. <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah, you it, it's much closer quarters, so there's you don't have that that space gap to sit there and load, you know, stuff your tube up with twelve. Um, so, you know, the obvious choice is you you have to run MagFed um, mm -hmm. if if you want to perform well. And so, um, actually, uh, Lanny and I found my found ourselves in the same boat because uh, you know I shoot for Benelli and Lanny shoots for Beretta, mm -hmm. and so. We both obviously wanted to represent Team USA the best that we could. Uh, so, you know, we both made the most obvious choice. Well, if we're going to run an open gun, we're going to run the best open gun that's out there. So, you know, calling up Mike Whitesides and Lan and, <clears throat> you know, and asked him, like, hey, uh, what can you do in a short amount of time? <laughs> uh, and so the guys really worked super hard and they were able to get us our guns. Um, you know, we, uh, Lanny and I got our guns the same Friday. And so for her, it was two weeks before she flew out. Uh, for me, it was two and a half weeks before I flew <laughs> out. And it was, okay, here is what I've been hoping for. I've been prepping for this moment. Uh, and been, I'd actually been training with my rifle because I'm like, well, this is the closest thing to, <laughs> to running, <laughs> running a, a, a distant arms KL-12 or running the, the Vepper platform was, you know, just running my rifle. I'd have an AK sitting around. That would have been better. Uh, but, you know, we had a short amount of time to get trained up and get ready um, to fly out there. And I think that um, we did extraordinarily well. I mean, heck, Lanny did amazing. Uh, she was, uh, I believe she was fourth overall actually wow uh, yeah she freaking rocked it she's freaking amazing she's 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 my she's she's my ultimate girl crush yeah <laughs> yeah lanny's an amazing individual for sure great competitor yeah and and yeah and so the guns are are i mean just it's really just it's you know a lot of people say ah oh, shotgun is a shotgun is a shotgun yeah that's all cool until you make it a um, a completely different platform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was one of those things that it, it took a little bit to get used to it. And it was funny because I kept my M2, like I brought my, my, uh, Benelli M2 with me every time to the range. Cause I was like, oh, I don't want her to get jealous. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I would bring it to the range and be like, no, I still love you. Like I still, still love you, but got to shoot this for this, you know? Nice. And so what, actually, let's talk about your, your training then. What was the, uh, I mean, you have two and a half weeks. That's a significant amount of training to cram into two and a half weeks to uh, get used to 
that uh, not only get used to that platform, but train up to be ready for the, the world shoot as well. Yeah, so uh, so uh, Eric Eckhart, my fiance, is a phenomenal trainer. Um, he's a phenomenal shooter. Um, you've had him on the show. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he was tall and... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the devil. What's up, Dave? Hey, <laughs> was he back there waiting the whole time for us to talk about him? <laughs> he was like, he was like, Heather might need some uh, reliable uh, rehydration here, so... <laughs> How's the interview gone? <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Good to see you. Hey, hey, good to see you too. I like how he does like the shooter side. He's got like the Adams are. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing timing. I'm I'm sorry he sat there for an hour and ten minutes to uh, to do that. <laughs> oh, like I do not. I love Adams arms. I do not. See, I don't shoot their guns though. <laughs> but no, you know it's funny because like. Um, even with that, like Eric and I, uh, we try to keep our shooting separate. So mm -hmm. we try to keep like the rifle companies that we shoot for separate. Um, and once we started seriously dating and got beyond the whole like, oh, I like you. Oh, I like you too. It was like, <laughs> we realized that like the training together thing was going to end. Very oh, quickly. really? Um, yeah. Because it, it's one of those things like, you know, especially when you're two very competitive people and very serious people, you know, and it's always that, like, you always hear that like guys like, ah, I keep telling my wife to shoot this way and she doesn't listen. And the wife is like, Oh, my boyfriend or my husband or whoever is a jerk. And, you know, and, and it's one of those things that with relationships and shooting, um, it's like with anything, it doesn't, it, what, even if they're teaching you like knife throwing skills, yeah. um, driving a clutch. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things that like you obviously as the person being taught want to do well. So there's already, already it makes that instructor student role um, mm -hmm. be tough. And so Eric, um, we knew the shotgun was going to come in at, at a certain point in time. And he came in and was like, Hey, he goes, um, I, I'm going to set up a training schedule for you. Like, but this is the thing, like we, we're breaking our rule. Like our, our rule is like, we, we always talk about shooting in theory. Like we'll have like, we'll have like drunk, like dry erase board, like shooting theory. <laughs> night. We're like, oh, you should shoot it from this angle. And this is what MOA means. And, you know, we've had many, many nights of sitting there dry, drawing stuff on the dry erase board and just like hashing out shooting in theory, but not doing it on the range. So he set up, he goes, I'm going to set up a training program, but you're going to have to treat me like your instructor and you're going to have to act like the student, you know, and I was like, okay. And so I was like, he literally, I don't even, I still to this day and I'm sorry, this is ultra mush. Like <laughs> <laughs> I told you I might throw up on this. I know. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like he seriously, like he moved heaven and earth and I swear to God, like half of, of, of the SF guys in the area were like in on it, like setting up places for me to train facilities to be at, like, like just like here, come to my farm and shoot here. And <laughs> just like, like moving heaven and earth so that I could shoot and train after work because I still had to work nonstop. And so mm -hmm. I was waking up at 0445 in the morning, going to the gym, getting in a solid workout, and then spending 15, 20 minutes dry fire uh, practice. And then I would get dressed for work and then go to work. And then I wouldn't get off of work until about 530 or six every day. And, you know, Eric was like standing by like, okay, I'm at the range. I'm ready to go. Everything's set up. Like all you need to do is get here. And I would get there. And it was great because it, it took a lot of stress off because he had the shooting program set up. And some of it, he was just kind of like, this is going to seem crazy. And you're, and, and you, and you might just be like, oh my gosh, why are we doing this? Like, this is so <laughs> rudimentary and, and, and basic. And, and he was, he had looked at the stages and looked at the program as like, this is what's going to help you excel in the shortest amount of time possible and get you as familiar with this platform as possible. 
and after three days, like, and I was going through uh, 250 to 350 rounds an evening um, between, you know, uh, if I was lucky, I would start at about 6, 6 p.m. And we would shoot until there was literally no light left until, <laughs> which uh, at the time here at East Coast, you know, that's about 8, 8.45, 9, 9 o'clock or so. Um, if it was raining, it, there was a couple nights it was raining and it was just like, nah, we have no time. <laughs> we have no time, so we're just going to shoot through it. And so, um, yeah, I lived a crazy schedule up until the world shoot um, with, I think I had one day off uh, from, from okay. shooting up until then. And it was epic, and I can't thank I can't thank him enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, first of all, that's that's uh, that's really awesome. I'm I'm very happy for you guys to have that kind of relationship where um, you know he can help you out, and you can take the step back and and realize like, hey, this is for America here. We're gonna do this. But um, let so the the uh, the training program two and a half weeks, tons of rounds downrange, 250 to 300 rounds per se- per session. That's a lot now. What was your mindset like when you uh, stepped on the plane? Uh, there's, there's no room for failure at this point. Um, like it, it really, the, the shooting on a team really changed, you know, like in my, in my mind that I've always been one of those people, like I love shooting and shooting is fun for me. And so, you know, if a match doesn't go well or if, you know, I stayed up too late or didn't train. I'm like, ah, I'm still going to go. I'm going to have a good time. I'll represent my sponsors well. I'll educate mm-hmm. people about the product. But, you know, if my performance isn't 100%, you know, I was still a good brand ambassador. Um, it, but for this, I felt like an added level of stress yeah. <laughs> to a certain extent because it was like, holy heck, man, like, you're not just wearing a USA jersey. You are on the Team USA ladies open team like Mm -hmm. it's you guys and like if if i fail i i influence them in in, in, you know in a bad way and i don't want to let them down like i don't want to let them down i don't want to let my country down i don't want all the people that i happened to tell that i was going (laughs) (laughs) like like Oh no! I you know, screwed the pooch, man, and then like we're like ruined it for everybody. And you know, it was um, one of those things. So I was like, for me, it was like there there was no other option. It was like I like I knew I needed to hit the gym and train beforehand. So it was like, well, gonna be out the door to work at seven o'clock. So zero four forty five is my wake up. Like <laughs> this, is, this is the schedule, and it was like you know, and and like I cut out, you know eating healthy and was like, okay, well, we're not going to touch alcohol until I get to France. And even then it was like, and it was kind of part of why I stayed by myself is like, you know, I'm very, very focused right now on, on my performance. And so I'm going to perform, I'm going to behave like an athlete. I'm going to eat like an athlete and treat it that way because like going to France isn't for playtime. Right. Playtime. This is, I'm representing my country. And and that's the biggest thing is, you know, like Americans can get enough flack, you know, you know, overseas. Uh, we've all seen the cartoons and, and memes and stuff. And so it was one of those things I was like, you know what, I want someone that if they meet me, that they have a positive experience because I mm-hmm. might be that person. They say, Hey, you know what? Those Americans are pretty cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and, and their shooters are great. And, and, you know, and I want them to have a positive experience. I want them to, um, I, I wanted to represent well, you know, and, and, you know, it was, it was hard. It was the hardest thing about it all was I was so proud to shoot for dissident arms and, mm-hmm. uh, the heart the Nelly was the, was the match sponsor. It was like the match sponsor. And like, I went over and um, the lady that was, she coordinates, she's the uh, marketing representative who uh, coordinates all of the um, Benelli Italy uh, shooting events. And I went up to her and I was like, hey, and I like talked to her about shooting open. I was like, I was like, oh, no, this might be like an awkward conversation. And she, and she was great. She's like, oh, no, absolutely. She's like, you got to represent your country. You got to you know, do this. And, and it was just. I don't know. It was just really, it was a neat experience shooting with the team because 
we supported each other and um yeah it almost kind of makes me wish that we had a little bit more i wish we had more team sports actually um like we, you know we have like three man three gun and right um yeah it's kind of it was a it was a cool experience you know it's that like you know you you want to do well for each other and and I, like the dynamic with our ladies team was great like I literally could not have shot with better women. Like we all, like our personalities just mesh so well. And it was like, like I would shoot with you and I would hang out with you anywhere else. Like anytime, like they were just awesome. That's fantastic. That's, it sounds like such a great experience. And the, uh, the team environment is definitely something that's unique, especially for, for us who we, we compete on, every other weekend in an individual sport. So it's, it's not like you have other people relying on you. So <laughs> it's, I'm glad that the, uh, the experience turned out, uh, turned out well. And, uh, and it's a positive one for you. Yeah. It, it was amazing. We have to have you out next time. Yeah. I'm down. Now that I know about modified division, like I can just right? load the two up and just shoot away. I'm all right. I'm in. <laughs> ah, I think that was one of the other cool aspects was, uh, seeing how all the other different countries and uh, competitors, how they modify their shotguns. Oh, yeah. Like, some of the pump guns that guys were running, like, I'm just like, is that even, like, it was like Terminator guns, just like, just, like, stripped down, just, just amazing, like, some of the, some of the advanced modifications that they have done to these shotguns that I'm like, wow, like, we're not even doing this in the States yet, but. I know, you know, and I was watching some of the, uh, the amazing videos that people were showing of, like, their, uh, their world troop prep from other countries where, I mean, you can't understand what they're saying, but you're just, like, watching what they're doing, and it's like, holy cow, like, they, you know, like you said, that is their one thing in in several countries uh shotgun sports are like pretty much all they have so when they have one gun and they have all the time in the world to to modify that one gun and they're not chasing uh, gear like we are in three gun um you come up with some like serious ingenuity and i'm such a like mechanical nerd like that stuff was just like really tripping me out as some amazing things came out of that yeah there, there were uh i had my camera out so i was running around and you know uh, for those that don't know, when I'm not shooting, uh, I generally like to be behind a camera or up in the mountains. So <laughs> nice, um, or both. I, <laughs> or both. Yes, or both. Yes, both. Um, but I, I had my camera. I was like taking pictures. Like some of the, like I even saw people like had like their shell catch is like cut down at like a 45 degree angle. Um, just some, just some like really interesting modifications, like some of the modified guns, you know, have these like large, crazy muzzle brakes on the end. Um, you know, it's just, it was just really interesting looking at the different like, uh, shell caddies, the different mags, the different mm -hmm. styles. Um, I think it was Thailand, uh, because Claudia had pointed out where in Thailand, they have a saw where you shoot a, uh, basically like you shoot it into, so tube fed shotgun. And they had like, I don't even know, like the, the video was grainy, so I didn't even get to see it. And never, I never got the opportunity to see it in person where they literally just like take the tube off and swap it with another tube. Yeah, yeah. I was like, whoa, like what is that? And <laughs> it's just incredible to see like what they come up with and, uh, and, and honestly, uh, hanging out in between stages with the international competitors was super cool. And it was really one, uh, if you don't appreciate being an American and living in the United States and <laughs> the second amendment rights that we have hang out with international shooters and it'll definitely, definitely make you miss home. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. You know, you know, Heather, um, something you said there really just, excites me the uh, the fact that you know there's all these different um these different guns from all over the world but they're all playing by the same rules so it's it's like uh you know 800 people's interpretation of the rule set and like how they come up with a solution to the exact same problem and i think that's cool that there's so many different uh different approaches you know to uh to the to the same issue i think that's really cool and probably yeah. a really exciting thing to uh to see live as well yeah, it, it was super cool. And yeah, just what an amazing group of people. Uh, and it was just, 
uh, we had, you know, the just listening to the different, you know, struggles that they go through and, and, and what they have to go through just to do something that we can just throw the gun in the back seat of our car and just roll to the range. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, we're going to fill out this form and this form and then go through this. And then I got to go to this special such and such place. And yeah. All right. Yeah. And if you stop for gas on the way home and now you've deviated from your path and you can get arrested for that. Yeah. There's all kinds of things that we take for granted here. Like you you were telling the story of, you know, walking uh, out of your parents' backyard and shooting into the berm. I mean, that's, that's going to blow almost everyone's mind that, that uh, that's listening to this internationally. Yeah. Well, you know, it is, it's one of those things that was funny because um, I felt like, uh, a lot of the shooters, like they, they were kind of reminded me of like the three gun family, you know, mm-hmm. like everybody was really um, like, especially those that at least spoke decent English and like we could communicate really well. It was like, once you start talking to each other, it's like, ah, you know, it's like I've known you for 20 years. And, uh, you know, you listen to people um, and some of them were talking about current uh, legislation that they were going to be fighting in their own country that was going to make it more difficult for them to be able to uh, compete. Uh, in the shooting sports. And and then I heard about so many other matches. Like we had um, one of the photographers that was taking great pictures of everybody. Andy Rose was like, yeah, you should come to Greece and like shoot a shotgun match in Greece. And like, that would be amazing. Like, you know, and- I didn't know uh, that was a thing. Yeah, like, cool. Like I never associated Greece with, you know, with it's a shotgun and um, learned more about like the Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland does a phenomenal match that, um, actually my teammate Aaron Hayes and, uh, and his wife, Nikki went and shot, um, last year and heard that the township is going to get so like, they're trying to turn it into a festival. And so it's literally going to be like small town carnival, like pony rides and shotgun shooting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I have to sign up for that. Like, I love pony rides. Like, what type of an amazing, what an amazing experience to be able to go to Ireland or go to any of these countries and be able to, you know, shoot and do what we love. And um, I think we had a good reception reception from people. Um, Lanny and Diana and myself uh, went out to lunch and had a, a table of Frenchmen uh, buy us our lunch because <laughs> we're shooters. <laughs> oh, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah. They, they actually came up to our table. We're sitting there and then actually, I think it was the last day. And so we're just smoked. Everybody's just tired. And we're sitting there and we're, we're just chowing down on this big <laughs> French meal. And uh, this old man comes up to our table. And I think, I think they had been day drinking. Just <laughs> like <laughs> they had probably been there all morning, but you know, a bunch of old men and they're smoking their cigarettes and drinking their wine and beer and, came over and he didn't speak any English at all, but he goes, Oh, you, and he goes like this, like makes this like <laughs> shotgun type type symbol. And Diana's like, Oh, like pulls up on her phone and pulls up a shooting video. And he's like, Oh, this is what we do. And he was like, Oh, this is amazing. He like brings <laughs> her over. And like, she's like, I actually took a picture of her at one point where she's leaning over the table, showing these guys shooting videos. And they just like, they couldn't speak a lick of English, but they kept going, like (laughs) and it was awesome like i i don't know it was just cool it was cool and yeah and then we were super surprised because the waiter came up was like oh yeah the uh the crazy old guys over there got your got your dinner (laughs) or got your lunch (laughs) but it was it was definitely amazing um i can't wait for the next one uh the one thing you're, you're gonna go again in 2021 then absolutely uh so we talked about it um and you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I want to shoot open again. And uh, I would like for the U.S. to not only be gold and standard, but also be gold and open. Um, you know, we were, it, it was amazing to have Josh Froelich win overall. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the Russians are very, very good and shooting open, you know, that is, that is their platform. That is their gun. Uh, literally, <laughs> literally their gun. Like they grew up like since toddlers, we've been running Saigas and, and, and Kalishnikov, you know, and, uh, they, to have Josh win it was pretty epic. 
I mean, you know, and especially to have, you know, seeing him stand up there, uh, you know, and hear the national anthem is, is pretty epic, you know, and, and we were able to experience that while we were in second place, you know, but it was like, you know, you're standing up there and I, I'll say this and nobody else will probably say this, but just like, you're standing up there and it's like, I was like, and we're holding the American flag. And I was like, mm, no, next, next time, next time we'll be up there. Like next time <laughs> you're all going to get to hear the national anthem until you're sick of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you're gonna hear it in every division because we just want to be like back-to-back champs but uh yeah no i'll definitely i'll definitely do it again uh and, and uh i'd like to shoot with the same ladies again very cool so let's let's uh back up just a little bit here you said you're not competitive but then you just uttered the uh the statement of <laughs> next year we're gonna be here in the national anthem <laughs> i was not competitive until i got into the shooting sports really yeah. And are you competitive now? Yeah, I'm pretty competitive. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it depends on how much I've been working. Like, um, managing a career full time makes it hard. It's it's made it significantly harder. And and uh, you know, the past uh, eight months or so, like, I really dedicated really dedicated to my job because like, okay, we're gonna get this thing, get this thing running, and and do all of this stuff, and then shooting's gonna take the back burner. And, you know, now I've gotten back into, okay, now it's back into the motions and back into training. But it's like, this is what standard everyday people have to do is, is yeah. you have to take your three gun training, your shooting training, precision rifle, whatever it is. Uh, and you've got to work that around your life. And for some people, it's like, okay, cool. I have a two hour window that I might be able to get some stuff done. Or I've got maybe 30 minutes a day where I can dedicate and then I've got to spend all my training on either the weekend or whatever. And, and it's amazing to see how many people have done so well and they make it, make it work, but you just kind of have to shift some priorities around. You got to turn the TV off. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. You know, I, I'm kind of uh, in that mode myself and, you know, the last couple of years, all I've been doing is basically traveling, shooting three gun. Um, but you know, I'm here in the, uh, the three gun show world headquarters and you can see over my shoulder there, my guns. So yeah, I'm, I have like my dry fire. Peer- I'm sorry. Yeah, what, what, what shotgun you running nowadays? That that's a, uh, P 3000. I'm shooting a pump division next weekend. So, wow. uh, yeah. Yeah. So normally, you know, I've got the, uh, Breda B 12 IS that, uh, Hayes custom guns tuned up for me, but yeah, I'm shooting a pump division next weekend at the, uh, Colorado three gun championship. So I'm totally practicing with that, but that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. It's uh it's something different to uh to do, which has been kind of fun. But you know, when you talk about you know the uh, uh the time and time management and the sacrifice, you know, my big thing is is uh, on social media is I always do you know range day, and uh, I I can't tell you how many jealous DMs I get during the day of like you know I'm out on a Thursday uh, training or something like that. I'm at the range, but you know they don't see the uh, the Sunday where you're, you're working or, you know, the 10 PM where you're working and stuff like that. So everybody has the, the, uh, sacrifices and the, the same 24 hours in a day. And it's all in how you manage that and, and what you want to put into your, your sport versus your, uh, career. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a balance, right? It is. It's, <clears throat> it's really about, uh, you know, it's about balance and priorities and, um, you know, for me, it's like, I, you know, I sit at work and yeah, I understand why, like, cause I used to get that, like, uh, because I worked remotely, <clears throat> I, you know, I made my own schedule. And so I would set up, you know, do a little bit, bit of work early in the morning, then mid morning was training before it got hotter than hell and mm-hmm. then it was back to work. And so I would have, you know, I was going through a thousand rounds of rifle a week, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get like the must be nice like oh you're living the dream life and all these like yep. crappy messages it is and i am <laughs> and you know and i still don't know why people send those crappy messages like it's always kind of like well why do you have to be a debit because like there's plenty of times like and i and i reason i bring that up is because like my office doesn't have windows and mm-hmm. there are times where i actually i put a target up on my wall so i can just stare at it and <laughs> and i just like sit there on a conference call, like daydreaming. I'm just like, hmm. <laughs> I, I remember those, those days. And, 
I wouldn't about, I wouldn't dare like get on my computer and be like, it must be nice. <laughs> That's because you're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the keyboard commando. You're doing it all wrong. Must yeah, be. exactly. That will get you killed in the streets. <laughs> That's not real cover. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love those. All right, Heather. We uh we have some uh some comments in the uh the, the YouTube chat for people that are uh, watching along here. Uh-huh. Uh, first one is from uh, Jimmy Jones and ES2, and he says, "Did you compete against Corinne Moser this season yet?" Uh this season. I don't think so. I think she shoots a different division too, right? You shoot tech ops normally. Yeah, I shoot tech ops. She generally shoots irons. You know, yep. I think she might. So I didn't get into. I didn't start my shooting season until uh, Texas Multi Gun, and so even for that, because of my work schedule, because I had this big giant army trade show uh, that weekend. I Mm -hmm. flew out and shot the match on pretty much shot all of it on Thursday and then shot two stages on Friday or sorry, shot everything on Friday, shot two stages on Saturday and was out of there by noon and like flew out. So um, I didn't get a chance really to see anybody. It kind of sucked. It was like, I I realized after doing it, I was like, I will not do this again because I think Corinne was there and generally like she and I like, like, I love shooting with Corinne. She's awesome. Like uh, for DC project, she's been my roomie. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Like I, I hated it because I didn't get to see any of my three gun family. Like I was like, hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I haven't shot against her this year. I don't think. Gotcha. And then he also asked for someone starting out in three gun. How long of a barrel do you suggest on the Benelli field M2 and how long for the shell capacity? Or I guess what is the shell capacity? Uh, so, or, so I would go with the 24 inch. Um, everybody kind of goes between the whole, you know, should I go with 21 inch? Should I go with longer? But 24 inches is the perfect length for anything that you're going to do in three gun. It is, I don't recommend anything else, uh, truly. And then for the tube, uh, you want, you know, 12 plus one. Cool. Easy enough. And then, uh, so this person's, uh, um, Username is Mig Sticks, but uh, this is Mig. So he went with you to the uh, the world shoot. Heather, yes. what, what was your one big takeaway from the world shoot? Don't talk to Mig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like there's a story there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, gosh, my one big take takeaway. Um, I. F- I would say it's not as hard as you think. Um, I saw that there, like when they started talking about the world shoot, um, there were not enough shooters. Like one, we should have had more representation from the US. We really should have. But I think there's a lot of shooters that are intimidated to travel internationally and to do it. Cause I mean, heck yeah, I was super intimidated uh, until I like just made the decision to do it. So, you know, one, it's not as hard as you think. Um, and two, we need more shooters uh, showing up. Like we, you look at these other countries and you see how much support that they have from their country mm-hmm. uh, to go and compete at this. And we don't have enough on our side. Like we need to spread the word about it's a world shotgun shooting. And what a great experience it is, how good it is for our country and how good it is to represent. So I think it's um, one, it's amazing. And two, we need to spread the word here in the U.S. uh, more and sooner so that we can have more people compete. Because I'm I'm trying to think, I think Thailand had like almost 40 people. Oh, wow. How how many came with the U.S.? Oh, Meg would know. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) maybe 30, 32, I think might've been the number. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, we definitely, I feel like we need more. And I feel that um, when, when we come home stateside, you know, we need to have more, um, you know, I want to get more news sources and people to find out about it. Uh, You know, share your pictures, share your videos, do interviews, talk to people and tell them like, this is epic. You won't shoot a match like it 
<laughs> I won't shoot another match like it for another, you know, three another years. Three years, yeah. 2021. Uh, but yeah, to, that it's it's a cool experience. It's definitely worth doing it. Like, it's it's cool. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. Well, Heather, we've, uh, uh, we've been chatting for quite a while here. I've got a few last questions for you and then I'll let you, uh, get on with your evening. But, um, uh, the first one is going to be, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received as far as practical shooting goes? Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Ah, that's a good one. Do you have a, do you have a good example of uh, a stupid question you had one time that really helped you out? Uh, well, it was something I didn't ask, but I should have asked when I got the three gun. And like, we had talked about this before, um, <laughs> cause had to deal with safety and I yeah. hurt because of it. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that. So I think that, you know, it goes to the stupid questions. Like, you know, sometimes we get in the shooting sports and we don't ask all the questions that we should. We don't read all the rules that we should. We kind of, you know, skim over them <laughs> yeah. and go you know, and shoot. And, um, you know, when I first got into three gun, I was super excited. And like I said, you know, I started competitive shooting and that competitive bug, uh, bit me for sure. And I was shooting a match and I had, I had just gotten good enough in three gun that I was actually giving, you know, some of the other competitors a good you know run for their money. So, uh, there was a bunker stage, I guess I'll go straight into it. So there was a stage and, and this was just something I didn't know in three gun. So, uh, it was, a he had to like, yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah. So you started out in the bunker with your rifle mm -hmm. and I was down in the bunker and like, literally like, like chest deep hole sandbags completely on the front on the sides and on part of the back. So you're really walled in. So anybody that's ever shot indoors, it's really loud. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really loud. And uh, the RO is standing upside, outside of the bunker. And he's, you know, when he starts the timer, he you know sticks it down in the box so you can hear it. And I couldn't hear him with, I had some jankity air pro back then. And so it was one of those things like, once it was in, I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> and so I had taken my ear pro out to listen to you know what he was telling me about my range commands i'm like okay cool thumbs up i forgot to put my ear pro back in oh man and i just like i had taken it out and like put it in my pocket and forgot to put it back in well if anybody's ever run an sjc titan comp mm. on their rifle even if you're not in a bunker that is an exceptionally loud loud break like it is it does a very good job <laughs> of dispelling these. But of course, all of that pressure comes out with loud noises. So right. um, round round one, uh, first first trigger pull, I realized, oh, oh, no, no, this is this is bad. I've, I've made a mistake. Um, but I was afraid. And why I didn't immediately stop shooting was because I thought that I wouldn't be able to fix my score. I figured that if I stopped myself and said, Hey, I didn't put in my ear pro. I need to stop that either a, it would have been put on the clock and counted against me. And I'd have just to keep shooting or B I would have to stop shooting entirely and take all the rest of the rival targets, all the rest of the shotgun targets, all the rest of the pistol targets and, and take all those penalties. Yeah. All those failure to engages. Yeah, all the failures to engages, and I wanted to win. I wanted high lady. Like I was like, I'm gonna win. This is my thing. And so, like a dumbass. Sorry, like a <laughs> like what? like a nincom poop. I don't know. Uh, I decided to keep shooting. So I shot. I think it was like 32 rounds of rifle. Oh wow. Oh my god. And then you had to run up this little like steps, like ladder up out of the bunker. Uh, and then draw your pistol. That's right. There was no shotgun in that one. Draw your pistol and shoot a bunch of pistol to the left of the bunker, a bunch of pistol to the right of the bunker, and then you're done. When I finished, uh, it felt like someone had taken a baseball bat and smacked me upside the head mm. multiple times with it. I heard it was such a high pitch ringing that it was making me nauseous, and I had to go over to the side and I started dry heaving. Like it was, it was that bad. And every time someone would talk to me, I would hear this. I was like a stereo speaker going bad. This like high pitched screech. If someone said something to me, like all sound was just wrong. And, um, 
Unfortunately, I did irreparable damage <laughs> to oh, my hand. Yeah. I would imagine that's a lot of rounds. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I was like, oh, like, you know, it's like you go back and you're like, stupid, stupid, stupid. Like, is a, is a match, is a match win uh, really worth your safety? And afterwards, like, the ROs, like, you know, of course, are coming over. They're like, Heather, like, are you okay? What the heck's going on? I was like, I have ear pro. They're like, you what? <laughs> like, oh my God, it's just a local match. It was like a local three gun match. Yeah. Like, That's something we would have just started you over that, like, they're like, that is safety 101. They're like, if your eye pro falls off, if your ear pro falls out, if you start shooting and it's not in, like, stop yourself. We will restart you. Like, it is not worth hurting yourself. And I'm like, what was that again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's so, I mean, it's it's amazing because it, it seems so silly now, like, again, with the gift of time that to uh, to reflect on it. But, at you know, at the time, it, it's like you really want that 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 win, that high lady, but like you said, like there's no club match in the world that's worth not being able to, uh, to, to hear. So I think that's a good lesson. I thank you for sharing that. It, it's yeah. definitely something I see a lot of uh, newbies doing where, you know, I'll, I'll be standing in the back and be like, stop that guy. He doesn't have any ear pro. Yeah. You know, and I've seen people, I've seen girls go through or guys and they're like, ah, oh, afterwards. I'm like, no, no. Like, and it's like, like my one thing, like, like, Shooter 101 is is if at any time anything safety related happens, like your eye pro, your ear pro, your belt's coming off, just freaking stop. <laughs> it's yeah. not worth it. Because now at least when I'm uh if I'm in loud noise like loud noisy areas or a restaurant, um I have a tendency not to if anybody sit on this side, I can't I, I have a hard time hearing them. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's but it works well. It works well for Eric and I because between the both of us, it's just kind of we're constantly like yelling, usually, like, huh? Why? No. <laughs> we'll just text each other when he's upstairs and I'm downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It works good. Well, uh, yeah. So seriously, thank you for sharing that story because that that is uh, you know something that is is huge and it's very important because you only get one go at it. So if you damage them for good, you're you're kind of screwed. Yeah, I can armchair quarterback that one. Uh. <laughs> yeah, pretty easily, right? Well, Heather, um, next question. Where do you see the sport of three-gun headed? So uh, it's funny, actually. I was talking about this at work, uh, talking about some of our retail stores. And it was, you know, I've actually, like, I'm trying to push our company to um, cater more towards the shooting sports because mm -hmm. we don't. Currently. And it's because I only see three gun growing just like precision rifle has continued to grow. Um, three gun. I, I don't know. I really like to see some true numbers on it, but I'd like to say it's probably one of the fastest growing shooting sports out there. And I don't know if it's necessarily because, um, you know, I think well, I think a lot of it has to do with social media, and due to social media, people see it, and it seems more extreme than some of the other shooting sports, and you know, definitely seems like it's you know so so different than um, what people are used to thinking of when it comes to shooting. But um, I see it only continually continuing to grow. I mean, uh, I I actually said today I was like, you know, we have college three gun teams now. Yeah, like, uh, incredible. Yeah, like Florida State, Texas A&M, Core Cadets. Uh, you know, I'm like, okay, if you can get colleges and universities on board with the shooting sports, then I don't know, maybe in a few years, like maybe once things calm down and people gain some sense, maybe we get college, uh, get high school teams. Like, what, you know, that might be a bit of a push. But I only see the shooting uh, three gun growing, and part of why I see it growing so rapidly and only continuing to grow is we've a lot of people say like oh we have this big buying surge of firearms during the obama obama administration mm -hmm. it actually started before obama like it started at the sunset of the assault weapons ban yeah for sure that's when i got um all my cool stuff <laughs> yeah like everyone's like oh crap like we can buy it now so we've essentially you know had you know 
like, gosh, what, 15 years or so of, of just like this constant rise of people buying guns, buying guns, buying guns, right? And now it just seems like the firearms industry is tanking, right? Like, we're like, oh, everybody's like freaking out. Like, oh, we've got 35% less sales than, you know, you see major corporations, uh, major firearms companies going bankrupt. And, um, you know, I had a conversation with uh, with, with people and I said, you know, I, I think one of the ways to save the industry and save the firearms industry as a whole is to really push and amplify the shooting sports because you have all these people that the majority of them have been buying like crazy. They've been stockpiling ammo. Now they're just sitting on it and no yep. one's trying to take it away. Uh, well, depending on what state you're living in, if you're living yeah. in Washington state right now, that's not a good place to live. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but you know they're sitting on all these firearms, and so now this is a great time to introduce shooting sports. And I think that's why you see more and more people getting into it, and a lot of new shooters jumping straight into it because it's like, oh well, I panic bought a bunch of ARs <laughs> and shotguns and a shit ton of ammo. So what am I gonna do with it? Oh well, this looks fun. I'm gonna. Now I'm going to use it. So um, I think that's kind of one of the ways that I think a lot of uh, firearms industry um, or manufacturers can start. They should look at you know catering towards the shooting sports. You know, I just realize it's such a small percent of the firearm owning populace, mm-hmm. but it's still rapidly growing. And you know, if anybody's ever you know you know as well as I do, or any three gun competitor knows that. Three gun is not a cheap sport. No, it's definitely gear intensive. We're like super buyers of gear. Yeah. Like, I'm like, are you kidding? Like we buy everything. We're buying, we're spending, people are spending $20,000 a year or more on, on three gun stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I only foresee it uh, growing more. I just, I look forward to seeing gun companies that have never really done anything for the shooting sports Mm -hmm. stepping up stepping up to the plate and producing something that uh, that competitors can start using. Yeah. You know what I really like about what you said there was the uh, um, let's go going back to what, what you were talking about with the world shoot, when you say like, you know, we need more people to shoot the, the uh, world shoot to spread the word, to show what a good time it is. It is it's the same thing with the shooting sports in general. <clears throat> we talk about how the, uh, um, the shooting sports is such a small portion compared to like hunting, right? Well, mm-hmm. hunting, you know, we've been doing that for like literally hundreds of thousands of years, right? We just have these amazing tools to do them now. So yeah. shooting sports is something that is is relatively new, especially when you uh, compare it to hunting. So yeah. of course it's a small segment of the market, but with yep. the help of firearms manufacturers, you know, in, in promoting and in supporting uh, shooting sports, we can grow the shooting sports, which creates more buyers, which creates more uh, support in the shooting sports, which creates more buyers. You know, it's just like round and round. So it's it's like the uh, the the farm league kind of thing. Um, and it, yeah, it, it is it is absolutely uh, important and to to have those industry partners that are are stepping in and trying something new is really exciting to see because they're looking for a unique way to market now that they um, mm-hmm. are unable to market based on panic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those things I actually thought about it. Um, there's an event I've constantly been trying to get you to come out to uh, is Duskin Three Gun. Yeah, dude, put me down for 2019 on that one. I totally want to come. It's always it's always on like it, because we because the guys that run the match they always have to work with um, range control because the match is on base, so it always ends up being like the most awkward weekend ever. Right. <laughs> uh, but like, it, it's one of the things that I see so many sponsors, like we've, we've all seen the price table go down uh, at, at major matches over the past few years. Um, like it just has steadily kind of dwindled and staggered off. But yet at Dusk and Three Gun, we still see a large amount of support. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that is because Dusk and Three Gun um, for those that don't know, it's kind of a invite only for civilians, but the the purpose of the event is to encourage active duty service members to get into the shooting sports because um, the uh, Mike Duskin, who the match is 
uh, was started in honor and in memory of and, and memorialized for, Mike was huge into the shooting sports. He was huge into USPSA, raising his children in the shooting sports hmm. and bringing other members of the military community into the shooting sports for, you know, for, you know, it was, it's a positive environment, bringing their families into it. He was convinced that it makes you a better war fighter, you know, all these various positive, great things. And so they started this match in honor and memory of him. And I've been shooting the match from the start and this was the fifth annual year. And, you know, the first few times you'd see these guys come in and shoot the sport. And these are avid shooters. Like most of the guys that shoot it, uh, are, are third group guys and they love guns. They love shooting, but they're just kind of like, eh, you know, they don't really <laughs> shoot. They don't shoot competitive shooting, you know, not, right. not very many of them, but they started doing dusk and three gun and these guys started getting into it and they, and then, you know, all it takes is, you know, your first three gun match and you're like, Oh my God, this is the most fun. And so like this year, Oh my God, I think we had 160 competitors. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And very, very few civilians. And it's one of those things where the sponsors that are supporting it know that most of the guys walking them off with the stuff on the price table, they're taking it and they're literally turning around and shooting it. Like that's, yeah, that's really cool. Half the guys don't get, understand the fact when you walk the price table, like, no, no, or go grab the highest value item. They're like, oh no, I really need a trigger. And they just like, we'll grab a trigger with the, like an optic sitting on a table, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things I think that the more we can bring new shooters into the sport and keep, you know, get, get the neighbor, get the people, get the, get the military or law enforcement guy. That's kind of like, ah, I like shooting, but nah, you know, competitive shooting's not my thing. The more you can bring those people into it, I think it's going to, you know, really help the sport and, you know, promoting it on social media, more people, people like to see extreme things. That's why CrossFit blew up so much. People see cool stuff and they, they want to, <laughs> do, do <laughs> cool things too. So, you know, I yeah, think and you know, we are uh, we are an observation society. We love uh, watching people do cool things too. But the uh, the great thing about three guns, you can actually get out there and do those cool things yourself, which is kind of fun. Yeah, and you don't have to be in CrossFit shape either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Heather. One one final thought or one piece of advice for the audience here. Okay. And that's on that's on you. Go for it. Oh, I mean, I was like, uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I would say it's like it was what I would tell my younger self is don't wait. Don't wait so long to get into shooting sports. Like, don't be scared. Like, um, I think the shooting sports, no matter what discipline, is full of the most amazing, nicest, extraordinary people in the world. And even if you don't have the gear, just go to a match, talk to people, just, just walk up and talk to them. Like everybody is really friendly. I promise. Uh, and just get out there, learn about the sport. And most people will loan you gear. Um, most of us, because we have bought gear many times before, as we were going through <laughs> learning what gear we prefer to run, we generally have a stockpile of it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Extra belts and rigs and guns and all sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't wait, get out now, um, go now, shoot now, don't wait. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I like it. Well, Heather, that's a great final thought. Thank you so much for being a part of the, uh, three gun show. Thanks for giving me your, your evening here to share with the, uh, the three gun show audience. This has been a ton of fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was super fun. <laughs> Stop.